Tonight we're talking about how do we know our religion is right. Now, one of the first facts is more of a superficial one. Not necessarily a proof, but I thought it was still cool and I wanted to include it. So, we're going to check that out. The first fact we're going to talk about is Christianity is the number one religion in the world with over 2 billion people who at least claim to be Christian. Of course, there's always going to be people who say they're Christian and aren't really, you know. But as of right now, we hold the 31% of the world's population in our religion. So Christianity at the top, I like seeing that. Yeah, <laughs> We're at the top. And uh, this all comes back down to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Well, we see that Christianity has spread throughout the globe. And then it says the end will come after that. Whew. Must mean it's pretty close, huh? Now, the next uh, highest religion is Islam with about almost 2 billion in there. And then uh, there's the secular, non-religious people, atheists, so that's not really a religion, but you know they, they included that there, so I'm going to tell you. Uh, there's about 1.1 billion people who don't believe in anything. All right? We've got a lot of people who just don't know. They don't believe in anything. <laughs> then there's Hinduism, which is 1.1 billion, and then Buddhism, about 506 million. And then you have Judaism, which is 14.7 million. So not a lot of people there, but I, I, I think of the Jewish cultures. They got half of it right, you know. They're just waiting on the other half. I know Jesus is going to get a hold of a lot of them when the, when the church gets raptured out of here. Anyway, that's the way I believe it. Nevertheless, Christianity at the top. I thought that was a cool thing. Not to mention that we're the oldest religion, all right? The oldest religion in the world. As, as, as we know from reading the Bible, we see it dates back all the way from the creation, right? We, we see God uh, talking about that in the Bible, and we see that he had a relationship with Adam and Eve, and it started there, and then things progressed to Abraham, and he, you know, that's where the Abrahamic stuff started going on, and that's where Judaism comes out of that, and then, you know, keep trucking along, and then Jesus comes on the scene, and now we got Christianity, all right? So it's all connected. Amen. So we do have the oldest religion in the world. And that stems from this scripture, Luke 150. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. We've seen it passed down from generation to generation. Amen. The truth, it started out in oral tradition. People just, you know, said, hey, God is God. You know, and it started there. And then people started writing stuff down. Then we got the Bible. Amen? But ours is the oldest. We see that there have been other religions that are now extinct. All right? So there was the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Germanic and Norse religions, the Mayans, all of those have ceased. All right? You got some fringe people who, who say, oh yeah, Odin and stuff like that and Thor. That, they they're just whack jobs. They're not real. They don't, I don't even think they really believe it. They just think they're cool saying that stuff. So anyway, those religions are dead. They're gone. They're extinct. Right? And some of those were great civilizations. That's the crazy thing about it. If you think about it, just let's just take the Greek and the Roman, for example. They expanded so far. I mean, it was massive. The empire. I mean, they I don't I wouldn't say they covered covered the globe, but they definitely had a big portion of the continents, and there was a lot. So to see that it came to nothing just shows you that God is behind our religion, right? Being that it was the oldest and it's still here today and is at the number one spot, there's something extra behind it, amen? amen. There's something extra, and you can see God destroying those other religions. No, this is not the truth. What we believe is the truth. Amen? Amen? All right, so now we come to our slide here. We have the most popular book in the world. Amen? This is actually an outdated graphic, but I still like the, the look of it. We see that this is the Holy Bible here. 
boom, all the way to the top. Yeah. We got uh, quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong or whatever. I can't pronounce that Chinese name. Then we got Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, and stuff like that. Other famous books. But the Bible at the top. Now, what I looked up was more accurate. And it says there's about 5 billion <coughs> copies sold. And I bet those are underestimated. All right, because I'm thinking that's more of people buying it for themselves and, and, you know, maybe giving it to somebody else. But there's also been many Bibles printed and just given out for free. All right, in other countries, and the, we all know about the Gideons. You know, everybody's seen those little pocket Bibles. Yeah. Mill, billions of Bibles just everywhere. But we're still at the top. Amen. I love that. I love yeah. saying we're at the top. So these are some of the superficial points I wanted to bring up. Now we're going to get into more of the technical stuff. First, we're going to look at the archaeological discoveries. All right, the first one we got is the picture of the ark. We can't say it definitively because it just looks like a big mound, you know? I mean, what, what are we looking at? We don't even really know. But people have actually gone in and excavated some of the areas and tested, and there was wood, you know, and it's the right dimensions and everything on the right mountain, and it was just like... Is this, is this it? I mean, it seems like it. Amen. Then let's look at the next slide. Now, this is at the Red Sea, folks. Does anybody know what that is? That is pictures of chariots, chariot wheels. And people have gone in and excavated that or, you know, scuba dive down. And they found all these different chariots and spears and different things. Like, what is all this? And obviously, it is what we see in the Bible at the Red Sea when... When God parted the waters and the Egyptian army was chasing after them, God caused the water to cover them up and they just sank. And the evidence is still there. Amen? Now, there's gonna there's a lot of evidence that I did not include, but I just kind of picked out some of my favorites. It's they all they're always finding new stuff. It's amazing. God's word is true. Amen. All right, let's look at the next one. Do y'all remember what God rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone. Fire and brimstone or, or sulfur. Sulfur balls. He rained this down and they are finding it everywhere. They went out and found it everywhere. That's what y'all are seeing on the screen there. Oh, wow. They're finding it embedded in things. Embedded. God caused it to rain down. These are just many balls of it that they found. Just embedded. Isn't that amazing? God caused, God rained it down and left the evidence for us to discover. And if you have the Bible, you know what's going on. If you don't, you're like, what is all this random stuff? But we have the Bible and it tells us what happened. Amen? They found all of this where Sodom, which was one city, and Gomorrah, which was another city. They found all of this stuff there, which corroborates what is mentioned in the Bible, which is so amazing to us. Amen? And what's it's amazing to me? That we have verifiable evidence that we can actually go back, check the source, and then go look for it, and it's there. That is reliable, folks. Yeah. All right, let's look at the next one. This is the city of Jericho. The ancient city of Jericho. Y'all see that? Pretty big city, wasn't it? Yes. Do y'all remember the story associated with that? So God told the Israelites to march around the city for six days. And then on the seventh day, they blew the trumpets and the walls caved in on itself. The whole city caved in on itself. Isn't that amazing? They found the spot. For many years, they couldn't find Jericho. And then they found it. Now, it doesn't look like a lot. You know, it look, looks like, what is this? What am I even looking at? But, you know, through time, you know, sand and dirt and things get piled up on it. But the, they found out, look on the next slide. They found out the walls, sure enough, caved in on themselves. And these are all sediments and other things. But they found out that the walls, sure enough, caved in on itself. And we have the evidence for that right there. Some of these pictures aren't doing it justice, but these are archaeologists came and they're like, hey, this is the, the biblical account of what happened. So, you know, some people could say, oh, well, it was just an earthquake or whatever, but God said this is what happened. What are you going to believe? I choose to go with God. Amen? Amen. Amen? All right, let's look at the next one. 
This should be a big rock with a crack in it. Now this is supposedly the big rock that God told Moses to strike. And water came spewing out in the wilderness when everybody was crying for water. They were thirsty. Hey, how are we going to feed our animals? God said, go, go strike that rock. And water came flooding down and made like a river in the desert for all of them to drink. We found a rock. It's in the right location. Is it the right one? I don't know, but we found a rock. Amen? <laughs> we found a rock. All right, let's look at the next one. Now, this should be the Shroud of Turin. Now, we don't know for sure, but there is very good evidence that this was the burial shroud that Jesus was wrapped in. We don't know for certain, but there is a lot of good evidence. Just one of the, just to, I'm just going to talk about two things, but there's a whole teaching on just this. All right? They've examined the blood. Guess what? He's a man, so he's supposed to have XY chromosomes, right? Sorry to talk about science right now, but he, the, the blood only was showing up X. Now we see that Jesus was born of a virgin, so he wouldn't have that Y chromosome coming in, right? That's interesting. That's pretty. That's pretty interesting. Then you look at the picture. Look at that little <clears throat> the image of Jesus's face. Maybe. <laughs> They have examined this shroud and it looks like a burst of light went off from within and imprinted the image onto the shroud. Now, what does that look like? That looks like his transfiguration, right? Or him he just disappearing. That was very interesting whenever I looked at this study. And these are things that I hope that when you hear about it, you will go dig into it deeper because you will uncover a lot. I have so many things here that I kind of got to keep, keep it moving, but remember some of this stuff and look into it. Now, I'm not going to say 100%, yeah, that's Jesus, but it, it, it just so much appears to be, right? right. Pastor Octo, on his head, isn't that blood spots from his thorns? Yeah. Crown? Oh, yeah. Now, they have a video that's kind of like a CSI where they say uh -huh. his height, which he's 5'11", which is my height, so if you want to know how tall he was... But uh, he, they see a side, and there's even a wound in the side, like where the spear was. Blood, there's blood. Blood pools in the back. Yeah. Yeah, there's a guy who totally, yeah. They, they draw, Maybe right there. They do a negative image where they draw up the back, and you can see all the flagrum where all the whips hit. When they draw up the blood, they, they basically increase the contrast of the image where all the blood was, and then you can see all the, the whippings. And, and it's, it is amazing, folks. I've got a book by Grant Jeffrey, and he talks about there's pollen from plants yes. that only grow in Israel, Jerusalem. So you wouldn't you wouldn't fabricate something like that. How would you do that pollen? And then at the feet, where his feet would have been, there's limestone that is only specific to Jerusalem. Right. You know, as he carried the cross, he you know barefoot and would have. Pollen. There's so much stuff. The next one we're going with is prophecies fulfilled. Prophecies fulfilled. Okay. So one person fulfilling eight prophecies is. 100 quadrillion chance of that happening. Quadrillion? <laughs> I had to look up the name of what these zeros represented because I didn't know. That's a, too big of a number I've never even seen, really. 100 quadrillion. All right, that's after trillion. It's our national debt. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. It's getting there. So that's just eight prophecies, all right? That's just eight. One person fulfilling 48 prophecies is one chance to the 10 to the 157th power. Now, I didn't even look that one up. But you got to know that there's way more than 100 quadrillion. Right? right? If only eight was that, then what do you think 48 is? But Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. So how big is this number? All signs point to Jesus. Amen? Amen. All signs point to it was him. He's the guy. We don't, we don't have to look to Muhammad. He came way later. He came way later. Matter of fact, I did, I did look this up. His was like 610 AD. Way after Jesus. Jesus died around uh, 30 AD. And Muhammad's religion came about way after. And they're the second religion of the world. 
Should we put our trust in that? No. And I ain't even going to get into why we shouldn't trust Islam. <laughs> Jesus is the one we should put our trust in, folks. Yeah. He founded the truest religion. Amen? Yeah, yeah. We have substantial evidence that we can put our trust in. One, just one of the prophecies I'm going to read to us tonight. The prophecy of Jesus being the suffering servant. We're going to go to Isaiah 53, 4-6. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen? There's this guy that I like listening to, Jonathan Kahn. You may have heard of him. He said he had uh, <clears throat> written down this passage on a notebook piece of paper. And he left off the Isaiah 53 part. And he went around asking people, hey, where do you know this from? He went around the, the office and was saying, hey, do you know where this is from? They said, uh, and who it's talking about? They said, that's the New Testament and they're talking about Jesus. Everybody. They're like, yeah, that's the New Testament talking about Jesus. And he said, no, that was in the book of Isaiah. Yes, it is talking about Jesus, but it was a prophecy 2,000 years before Jesus came on the scene. Talk about exciting, right? And he brought this truth to some of the Jewish people, right? And, and they were like, wow, they were astonished. That's just one of the prophecies he fulfilled. Amen? Just one. Here's another one. I've kind of been talking about this a lot lately, but I thought we should look at it. Let's look at the actual images. This is the Euphrates River drying up. Before and after. Pretty simple, huh? Yeah. This is what it used to look like. This is what it pretty much is now. Drying up. Let's read the scripture, folks. Revelation 16, 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. It isn't completely dried up yet, but folks, look how close it is. Yeah, pretty close. I mean, it is close. Let's look at the next image. It's getting there. One difference in one year. It's getting there. Our next scripture of prophecy being fulfilled, Daniel 12, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. These two things. So, travel to and fro. The car was basically uh, invented right around 1886, but was widely accepted. People like had vehicles. They could drive around. The plane was invented in 1903. So, people used to just get around by horses before then, right? All those many years up until that point. But now, look at where we're at today. How everybody, almost everybody has a car, right? Everybody has at least driven one, right? Or had one at one point. Has anybody ever been on a plane before? Mm -hmm. Yes. I have. We can get all over the world in a, in, in a hurry. As a matter of fact, there are supersonic jets that can get places even faster, right? Faster than normal commercial airlines. They can get there almost whew, just within a couple hours. Just to the cross of the world, all the way around the world, it's just an insane thing. So we have that coming true, and then the knowledge increased. Around 1983, my birth, birthday, my birth, birth year, the internet was created, which has spawned massive knowledge outbursts across the globe. Now, almost everybody has knowledge at their fingertips today. Yes. Anybody can pull up, oh, what What did you just say? Let me fact check that. Let me go to Google real quick. <laughs> Knowledge has increased, hasn't it? Some people that used to just, you know, make things up as they go are getting fact checked. They can't do that no more because Google's around, right? <laughs> we know people like that, huh? <laughs> it is astonishing, folks. This is not all. This is just, just brushing the surface of prophecies that have been fulfilled. That, and there's things that are still on its way. But nevertheless, we have some more points we've got to get to. All right. So the next one is personal testimony. Because, in fact, our God is a personal God. Amen? He is a personal God, and He gives us personal testimony 
to share with others too. And I believe our personal testimony will trump outside evidence all day long. Amen? Here's an example. If somebody came up to me and said, your wife is not real. She does not exist. <laughs> I'm going to say, well, who's that woman I've been sleeping in bed with every night? You know? <laughs> You can't tell me my wife does not exist because I have personally met her every night, right? You know, I, I know her on an intimate basis. You can't tell me she doesn't exist. In the same way, God interacts with his people. And you can't tell me my God don't exist because I have experienced him. I may not know all these other scientific explanations or whatever, but I know for a fact my God is real because he has interacted with me. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can't change my mind on that. You might want to. It might make you mad, but you can't. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of some of his interactions. I had two dreams one time about demons attacking me. Freaky, scary stuff. Matter of fact, I did a reenactment one time with my friend. Cody right there, uh, we filmed it and you know, I had a whole teaching about dreams and how the devil can attack you. Nevertheless, the same scenario happened. A demon came at me and I was scared in the first one. I rebuked it in the name of Jesus and I woke up instant. What is that? How is that possible? That's, that's kind of weird, okay? Give you the benefit of the doubt, you just woke up, alright? It happened again when I was in ministry school. Demon came at me, screaming at me, same scenario, but this time I wasn't scared. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Woke up immediately again. Immediately. Both times. It was the name of Jesus. There's power, folks. Even in our dreams. How amazing is that? That is astonishing to me because it, it happened to me, you know? So... Some people might say, oh, yeah, whatever, whatever. You know, they try to explain things away, but it happened to me, and it was powerful. If you can't utter a single syllable other than Jesus' name, that's all you need, folks, because there is power in the name of Jesus. That's right. Another one is confirmations. He's always giving me confirmations. Right. All the time. There's so many. 2 Corinthians 13.1. This will be the third time I am coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. We just talked about that one, didn't we? Nevertheless, confirmations happen all the time. He confirms things to us about his word and his mission that he has for us, the plan that he has set up for our lives about himself. Amen. And the next one is he actually speaks to us. Has anybody ever heard from God? If you haven't, ask him. I trust he will speak to you. You know why? Listen to this scripture. John 10, 3-4. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him for they know his voice. You know, there's also another voice that speaks to us and that's the devil. He whispers in our ear, tries to get us to sin, tries us to do all kinds of weird stuff. But then we got God's voice. And we need to know the distinction between the two. Amen? Amen. Well, of course, we got our own voice that we, you know, I don't know about you, but I speak to myself sometimes. <laughs> I talk to myself in my head. We got three different voices bouncing around. We got to know how to distinguish them things. And your wife's voice. Right? My wife's voice. <laughs> <clears throat> Nevertheless, I want to talk about just one of the times he has spoken to me. Right here it says he calls him by name. One time I was praying really hard. I said, God, please speak to me. I want to hear your voice. Said, hey, it's been a while. Please speak to me. and Give me some confirmations. There's that word confirmations again. And I said, God, speak to me in my right ear so that I know for sure it's you. Speak to me in my right ear. <clears throat> I heard him say, Brandon, I love you. Very vivid, very clear in my right ear. I did not hear it on this side. It was so crazy. I said, okay, thank you, God. But at that exact same time, my heart did something it has never done before. And the best way I can describe it is it was like a firework of emotion exploding inside of my heart when he did that. 
It felt so good and so wonderful, I know for a fact my God was speaking to me. It wasn't the devil. It sure wasn't my own head. It was my God. Amen? Amen. And He will speak to you too, and He may not do it in that way. But if you ask for a confirmation, I bet you He'll give you one. Amen? Because He wants you to know that He's speaking to you. And I, want, I believe that He wants you to be able to know it's Him when He's doing it, right? Alright, here's another way that we know our religion is the true one. Miracles and works of God. Now, you may not have experienced them. You may say, well, I think that kind of stuff is just in the, for the, you know, for the New Testament guys and the apostles. You know, they did all, they needed all that then to get Christianity kicked off. I'm not going to go on the technical name of that, but you may think, you know, that kind of stuff has passed away. But God is still working miracles today, folks. Even if He's not doing it in front of you, He's still doing it all over the world. We know for a fact that Vincent was healed miraculously. Yes. We have a list in here to confirm that. The doctors were astonished. They said, whoa, something happened here. So you, had a you had a tumor, you had some cancer there, and now it's gone in his pancreas. Now that's the serious stuff, folks. That's the scary stuff. They say you can't come back from that one. It was miraculously healed as if it was never there. They didn't know why. They were confused. That our God can work miracles. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> there was a time where I... Uh, <clears throat> some of y'all may not remember, but I was having to use a cane kind of periodically. My knees were both giving out real bad. I was going through some just real hard times. And y'all prayed for me. <clears throat> I'm not using a cane. Haven't used it since. Amen. Yes, is my knee still bad? Yeah, but I'm not using a cane. <laughs> right. I got other problems, but I'm not using a cane. You know? I think problems kind of just circle around. You, got, you, you trade one out for another, you know? And that's just kind of the way I see it anyways. But nevertheless, I'm not using a cane. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> many prayers answered. So many prayers answered. Yes. How do I know God's real? When I pray to Him, things happen. Does everything get answered? No, not everything, but a lot. When it pertains to His will, it gets answered, folks. When I put in some extra effort, when I'm like diligently seeking Him and like really putting in some fervent prayers, like crying out to Him, those prayers get answered. When I put some, even go a step further and go fasting about something, those prayers get really answered. I've seen great results with fasting. And I want to encourage anybody, if you haven't fasted before, get to it. <laughs> Especially if you got something really weighing heavy on your heart and mind about something, you really need help with something, fast. And, and if it's pertaining to God's will, like you can't, okay, well, I need a million dollars, God. I'm going to fast for that. I, I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> but it could. I mean, I don't know. If, if he needed you to have it, he'll give it to you. <laughs> But it's not likely, all right? So don't think that. <clears throat> there was two cool things, and we'll move on, that happened to me when I was in ministry school. Some of y'all might remember this one, but <clears throat> one time I had prayed for, ga for gas, for God to help me with gas money. Or get, you know, to help me with gas is what I said. I get in my truck, and I drive, and I, and I, and I notice something weird, because I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to E. I'm, I'm probably not right on E, but I'm like right above it, you know? And I see my gas gauge go, do this number. And I said, whoa. I said, hold on. Now, of course, our first reaction was to say, oh, well, my gas gauge might be broke. But I said, you know what, God? I'm going to instead believe that you are giving me my gas. Right? I'm going to believe that you're filling up my gas tank right now. I mean, I'm running on like high faith right here. <laughs> I'm like, hey, God, that's what I'm going to believe for right now. Now, was I crazy? I don't know. I don't think so. But at the time, I was just seeing, you know, I'm, I'm like you know, experiencing things of God. You know, I'm reading stuff in the Bible. They're miraculous things. They're crazy. So I want to believe for that stuff. Right. And I see this happen, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to have faith in it. Amen? Instead of doubting, instead of whatever, trying to explain it away, I'm going to believe. So what do I do? I live out my faith. 
Amen. I drive as if it really is a full tank of gas. I drive everywhere. I'm driving all over the place. I, I see that tank going down again. And then just as it's about to get to empty, it shoots back up again. And I drive all over the place again. I'm talking about two extra rounds of gas, man. That talk about we need that right now, don't yeah, we? Yeah, really. Everybody's gonna go get in their car and say, "Oh, this is gas." <laughs> but it happened, and I'm not lying to you, folks. Some of you've heard me talk about it before, and I'm telling you that the God's honest truth. And I didn't just keep it parked in the parking lot and never drive it. I drove it everywhere. I'm living out my faith. Amen? Amen? And there's no way. There's no physical way that that happened. There was no sputtering. There was no clunking. There was no signs of me losing gas. Now, after the second time, I didn't push it any further after that. <laughs> I went and filled up after the next one. But <clears throat> I thanked him and, and I said, you know what? I'm believing that you did it for me. And can he do it today for anybody else? Yes. Another thing we prayed for is I, I, I prayed, I said, God, a lot of us that are living here on campus, we don't have a lot of money. If it can be so, provide for us some food. And I said, so much so that we have to give it away because we got so much. I mean to tell you, it was like food was coming out of our ears after that. There was people that were friends of friends and they were like, hey, you know, we, we know you're going to ministry school, we just want to be a blessing and we just donated. We went to Sam's and we went and bought everybody up their food for, for to enjoy. It was amazing. Then we had somebody who was working at Church's Chicken. She was you know, working there and they let her bring home, since she was at ministry school, they knew we needed food. They said, you bring home all the leftovers you want. She was bringing home boxes of chicken. I mean, we were sick of chicken. I felt like the Egyptians. I mean, I felt like the Israelites in the wilderness when they were tired of the quail. That's how we, how much chicken we were eating. And there were so many accounts of that happening. People making us food and bringing it up there. And our, some of our teachers would give us food and bring food for us. And it got to the point to where we had so much food on at least two or three occasions we had to give it to other people. Because we had too much to eat. Amen. And that's exactly what I prayed for. Yeah. That was God. Amen. That was God. I didn't tell nobody else that. I didn't tell nobody else that prayer. That was between me and God. But I was praying it. And I saw it come to pass. And I know for a fact that there's some of you out there that can attest to this too. That you were praying for something and you got it. You received it. Maybe you didn't have it for a while and then you prayed for it and boom, there it was. I know. That's the kind of God that we serve, folks. Amen. It's tangible stuff. It's reality. It's not just some fantasy or some movie we see that's, you know, it's crazy stuff that happened. No, this stuff happens to the true believers. Amen? Amen. you got to have faith. But it happens. Man, I'm going too long here. <laughs> <clears throat> Here's another one. The Bible gives us scientific things before it's actually discovered. So God will say something in the Bible and then science has to catch up. <laughs> it would be smart if they would just start reading the Bible and say, hey, whatever's written in here, go with it, right? Right. People used to believe that the earth was flat. Anybody know that? Yeah. Widely believed. Matter of fact, it's starting to catch on again for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. We got some crazies bringing it back out. <clears throat> Brittany always tells me, don't say that. You're going to offend some people. <laughs> That's a sad thing that there's so many flat earthers out there that I'm going to offend everybody. You know? It's like, it's a circle, folks. It's a sphere. And we know that because it's said in the Bible. Isaiah 40, 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Now there's actually two in this one. The, the main one that I wanted to focus on was the sphere, or the circle of the earth. But they actually has found out that 
Earth is, is expanding. I mean, not Earth, the, the uh, universe is expanding. Space. They see that it's spreading out like a curtain, just like he said here in the Bible. Amen? Let's get our sights right. All we got to do is read the Bible and we'll figure out what's right. <laughs> the next one is uh, bloodletting. Anybody ever heard of that before? Mm -hmm. Old George Washington had it done to him and he ended up dying after it. They thought if you could cut that out, the, the sickness would come out of the blood when you let it out of you. Mm. <clears throat> but they should have read the Bible because of Leviticus 17 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So that's a little extra. But nevertheless, the life is in the blood. Right? Right. right. Don't cut it out of you. You need all that stuff. Keep no. it in you. <laughs> But the cool thing about God is He gives us testable data. We can test it for ourselves. That's basically what science is. You have to test something to see it come to pass. But one of the tests is when we follow the truths of the Bible, our society prospers. When we don't, it does not prosper. We see so much evidence of that nowadays, don't we? Some of you older folks can remember way back you might have to go back to the 50s, but it was a little different, wasn't it, back then? You can see that uh, things have changed from then. You know why? Because people took prayer out of schools. That's one of the reasons. And, and in doing that, uh, many people stopped putting their trust in the Bible, stopped putting their trust in God, stopped going to church. Used to, I bet back in the 50s, if there was a Wednesday night service, this whole house would be packed like a Sunday. Yeah. And Sundays would be even overflowing. There'd be people out there listening with their ear up to the window. Right? Things have changed in a bad way. Look at this. So, 1962, there was over 39 million students who were forbidden to do what their, their predecessors had done since the founding of our nation. That was publicly called on the name of the Lord at the beginning of each school day. You started your day out in prayer. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, I do. I, do. I don't. I, do. <clears throat> I did it. I don't. Thankfully, I'm a pastor today. But I didn't get to have that. I didn't get to have that when I was in school. Now, we did have a thing called prayer at the pole. Did anybody remember that? We kind of took matters in our own hands. And I kind of, I was a part of that a little bit. Not every day, but I did go out there and be a part of that a little bit. Nevertheless, there is a correlation between our society and that steady decline of godliness because of those things. Because anytime we take God out of something, things get worse. That's right. There was this guy named William J. Bennett. He argued that America's culture's decline is signaling, signaling a shift in the public's attitudes and beliefs. According to the index of leading cult, uh, cultural indicators published in 1993, statistically portraying the moral, social, and behavioral conditions of modern American society, often described as values, America's culture condition was in decline with respect to the situation of 30 years ago. So, 1963. The index showed that there has been an increase in violent crime. It's up by more than six times. So, six times than what it used to be in the 1950s. All right? More, more than whenever they took prayer out of schools. You know, it's, it's up six times. Illegitimate births by five times. The divorce rate by five times. The percentage of children living, living in single-parent homes by four times. And the teenage suicide rate by three times. Just in that 30-year period, when people turn their back on God, you see the generations changing for the worse. When you kick God out of everything, which, which all the atheists would love to do, He's the only reason that we're still here right now. If, if God removed Himself completely from our world, we would be in total chaos. Amen. Total chaos. We would kill each other. There would be nothing redeeming about being in this world. The only reason that we have any reason to exist right now is because of Him. Amen. 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 
He is literally the only reason, and they don't know it yet, but they're going to see. He's going to remove himself for a time. And the devil's going to have free reign, and it's going to be the worst time in history is what it says. Nothing like it before and nothing like it ever. The worst time in history. Literally hell on earth. Demons running them up kind of a deal. It's going to be freaky and scary, folks. But I'm trusting we won't be here for it. Yeah, me too. But it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves... We see that, don't we? Selfies. Yeah. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Mm -hmm. We see that, don't we? Oh, yeah. People in the 1950s, they used to spank them kids, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, it's, oh, well, I don't want to be mean to them. I want to be their friend. <laughs> and now they're disobedient to parents. They're raising a culture that is geared against what civilization is supposed to be like. They're raising that kind of a culture. Unthankful. Yeah. Unholy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Slanders. Without self-control. Brutal. Despisers of good. Traitors. Headstrong. Haughty. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. And this is what the Bible tells us to do. Uh, from such people, turn away. It means don't be in close proximity in the situation of like having close fellowship with certain people, right? You can still love them. You can still share the gospel with them. But don't be like, don't let them in your inner circle kind of a deal, you know? It's getting crazy, folks. We're getting close to the end. I know we're kind of running over a little bit, but I just have a few more points. <clears throat> We can see God's nature through His creation. All right, Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So by the things God created, we can see Him. He put Himself into His creation. Now, one of the ways we see, He talks about that even the eternal power in Godhead, the Godhead, what does that mean? So when you look up Godhead, it actually means Godhood. Now anytime you add a hood on something, it means plural. Okay? So we know our God to be a trinity. Amen? And throughout His creation, He has put in the trinity. Matter of fact, there's a thing called the trinity of trinities. Go look that up on your own. I'm going to talk about something else, though. I'm going to talk about water as an example because I just used it in talking with somebody. Somebody came up here and was doing some work. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was asking me. He said, I've always wondered about this and I've always been confused on it. How, you know, about this Trinity stuff. You know, it's like, I want to believe in it. It seems like it's right, but it's very confusing. And I can understand that. And I, and I was telling him, I said, you know, the best way that I understand the Trinity as I said, H2O. And he looked at me, what? H2O. Just think about it. It exists in three different forms simultaneously at all times. It exists as water, a liquid. It, lists as, it uh, <clears throat> exists as ice, a solid. It exists as a gas, right? The vapor. But it exists at all times, and yet it is still H2O. I said, in the same way, God is still God, but He exists as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the, yet, they're still interlinked. Amen? And I said, that, that's just one of the examples, but that's the one I gave him, and he was like, wow, that makes sense. And that's one of the ones that's always made sense to me. Amen? Nevertheless, let's look at our next one. We know ours is right, our religion is right, because people mock it. People mock the truth. Matter of fact, the Bible said they're going to do that. 2 Peter 3.3 3, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. Scoffers who mock Christianity. When was the last time you ever heard somebody mock Islam? Nobody ever really does that because they're worried about them jihadists, yeah. you know? Worried about them suicide bombers. But you don't ever see anybody really making fun of Islam or Muhammad. 
Yeah, there might have been one or two. Nothing like Christianity, right? Seems like everybody loves to make fun of Christians and Christianity. It seems like you're not popular unless you do make fun of them, right? Nobody ever mocks Buddhism or Hinduism. Nobody ever mocks those gods because they're not true. They're fake. They were made by the devil. So the devil doesn't attack his own stuff. He leaves all that up to attack Christianity. That lets me know real fast in a hurry that what we believe is right. Because if you see opposition against it, man, that must be the truth. Right? Amen. No other religion do you do you use their their uh, their main proponent or their main savior as a as a cuss word. But in Christianity they do. Jesus Christ, they use his name as a cuss word. They don't say, oh Allah as a cuss word or Muhammad or or Krishna, or any of these other things. They don't use that as a cuss word, but Jesus Christ, they do. I wonder why. There must be somebody out there who really hates him, the devil. Our final point, who is he to us? We know for a fact that Jesus really did exist. We have that verifiable evidence. Even atheistic scholars would say, yes, Jesus, the man, did exist. They don't agree he was God, but... They do believe that he did exist, the man. So what do we do with that information? Either Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. There's three options. Which you going to pick? Right? Was he a liar? Was he crazy out of his mind? Or will you bow the knee? His followers knew him to be Lord. People did turn away from him at first, like Peter and some of the others were scared for their lives. They denied him. But when Jesus died and everyone saw him after that... They saw him walking around, even Thomas. <clears throat> Jesus said, hey, go ahead and put your fingers in my side there, bud. Here's my holes. Because he said, I ain't going to believe unless I do that. Jesus popped up on the scene. Well, now you're going to believe, aren't you? Talk about believe. These guys ended up going on to die themselves. They really believed it. At first they didn't. But then something happened and then they did. To die for what you believe in, that's something, folks. You don't die, you don't die for, for a crazy man. You don't die for somebody that you know to be a liar. No, you die for the Lord. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, as I was looking at that statement of Peter denying Jesus, I had a, had a video playing of uh, Cody knows who I'm fixing to say. But I was, I was working on this Bible study. I was listening also to a sermon by Leighton Flowers on eternal security. He believes in that, by the way. And it just so happened that as I was rereading that part about Peter, the guy just so happened to mention that exact same thing as I was reading it. The exact thing of Peter denying Jesus as I was reading it in my own notes. Talk about confirmations, folks. He does that kind of stuff all the time. Bring it back to that point. He does that kind of thing all the time if we're paying attention. If we're paying attention. It's a beautiful thing to be on the right side. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to know that what we believe is right. Amen. We have assurance of that. We have faith, but we don't have blind faith. We talked about that the other day. You mentioned that. We, we have faith, but we don't have blind faith because of all the evidence. There's so much evidence. And I didn't even brush the surface, folks. I had to give what I could give in just a short amount of time, but there's so much out there. For Hopefully you'll do your own studies. But the best thing, like I said already, the best thing that trumps all the evidence is those personal interactions that you get alone with your God. When he gets alone with you and you get alone with him and y'all spend that time together and you can see him answering those prayers and you can see those confirmations for yourself and you can hear his voice and you can see those little miracles that take place, you know that your God is real and what we believe is right. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we don't have to worry about it. The devil might come up with some new scientific evidence or whatever. Oh, this proves it. Oh, we found life on Mars. 
And what we believe is wrong. You Christians, y'all are wrong. Eh, don't worry about any of that stuff. We know what we got is right. Don't let the devil shake you on your foundation. Amen? Amen. Just trust in him. Amen. Anybody need to want to say anything? Uh, I got something on my phone. Uh, you know, when I, I remember, <clears throat> my dad had to remind me of it, but it, it was like, because I was like three or something when this happened. But, uh, you know, I never got to see my me or meet my granddads because they both died before I was born. I met my grandmothers. But I was, from the time I was born to the time I was three, I had this, I was very, very sick. And uh, I had seizures all the time. And uh, my temperature would always spike up over 100 degrees. Basically, the chance of me making it to even 10 years old to double digits was very unlikely. And uh, <clears throat> I started seeing what appeared to be my grandfather. Mm -hmm. That's what he told me. And dad thought I was crazy at first. It, uh, thought it was talking like it looked like I was talking to the couch or something. And then they opened up a photo album and I'm only three. And I said, that's him. That's Paul Paul. And they had never told me about him because I was only three. But my dad had a very bad feeling about this. Like he knew that demons can also take the form of loved ones as a trick. Mm -hmm. So dad went and he said a prayer. And he said after he said that prayer, that's when all that stuff disappeared. Wow. All my sicknesses and everything wow. was gone. I didn't have seizures no more. My fever wasn't spiking up anymore. It was wow. all gone. That's amazing. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, Anybody else? I just want to say what some people may have thought when you mentioned that about the uh, people don't die for a lie. Right. I had read when I was first getting serious about it and like the evidence and the apologetics, you know, mm -hmm. the study of the defense of the faith. Well, you think of like suicide bombers, you know, like jihadis and stuff, and they're told and they die for their religion. But the, the, the separate, the different, the distinct thing about Christianity is those men, the disciples, you may die for a lie, but you don't... You, something that you think is true, but you don't die for what you know is a lie. And those men right. saw something because they would have been the ones to see, you know? Like exactly. You, you don't die for something you know is false. Right. Uh, you may be talked into something or, you know, have uh, tradition. But anyway, those men saw something because, like you said, they went from being locked in the upper room, scared. Right. And then you had Peter denying him. Then he went to being bold when they were saying, hey, don't teach in this man's name or we're going to beat you and ultimately kill you. But all of them except John died as martyrs. Amen. Anybody else? You know what you're teaching tonight <clears throat> is uh, you can read, you start reading the Bible when you're a baby Christian and all that. You, then you begin to believe but what you're saying now with your experiences and probably most of our experiences, Amen. we know. That's so right. Way beyond belief, we know. That's so right. We have the reality of Jesus Christ. Amen. We, we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and also, uh, one more thing too, you know, with with my dad, you know, you know, I had talked about this before, but he had tried to commit suicide when I was in high school. And the doctors themselves... We're preparing us because it didn't look good because he had took a bunch of pills and everything trying to commit suicide. And uh, so they was preparing us and telling us that he may not make it through the night. And by the doctor's words, they said, if he makes it through the night, it will be a miracle. Mm -hmm. And he not only made it through the night that night, he made a full recovery. That's amazing. And then the doctor came up to us afterwards. He said, somebody was looking out for him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We know it to be true. I bet you experience little miracles all the time and, and, and you don't even realize it. But once you start getting close to God and you start seeing these things, you start saying, man, that was a miracle. You know, I think it was last Wednesday. No, was it, when, was it Wednesday? Or? I think it was. No, it was when we went to eat. What day was that? That y'all were going home? Friday. Friday. We had went to a restaurant and... Nana was like, y'all come pick me up. She just had an OG attitude about it. She said, y'all come pick me up. <laughs> no, she, anyway, mom had pulled up to the car, uh, pulled up to the door, and uh, <clears throat> Nana ended up getting in. But that little bit of time, 
that not awaited, that mom waited, <coughs> was just enough to keep them out of a five car pileup that they ended up coming into. That's right. Like, like one minute later. One minute and they're right behind it. They could have been right smack dab in the middle of all that. Yeah. Who knows? Might not even be sitting here tonight, Wes. Right, right. That kind of stuff happens all the time. And there's no telling of the stuff that we don't even know about. Right. Don't we don't need, there's no telling when we get to heaven. I pray he tells us all the things. Yeah, I do too. All the things that he kept us safe from and protected by. We got guardian angels. We really do, folks. I believe that. There's angels. There might even be one in here tonight. God bless you. Thank you for yes. being with us here, brother. Yes. Thank you for being here. But they're, they're there and they're real. Just like the devil does his thing and has his demons, God has his angels and he might be keeping them. God might have said, hey, Nana, won't you just hang back a little bit <laughs> right now? Let them come pick you up. <laughs> just a little whisper. We think it's our own idea. We just so smart, you know. But he had a plan. He was keeping them safe. He was. He does his own thing, too. Yeah. And if you ever get to the point to where you're struggling and you feel like, well, maybe I don't know if I believe the right thing, look into all the evidence. Do a deep dive study into it because you'll walk away from that thing feeling refreshed and renewed. Yeah. Man, what we believe has a lot of evidence behind it. And there's been a lot of atheists start out trying to disprove what we believe, and they became believers. <laughs> Because of the evidence, folks. It's out there. They couldn't deny it. They're like, man, I'm going to have to check my pride at the door. This is the right thing. And they stopped being atheists and became Christian. And that's a beautiful thing. And I know he can do it for anybody. And you might got some family out there that you've been trying to figure out how to talk to them. Maybe some of the stuff we talked about tonight can give you some encouragement to share with them. Maybe there's something we, that we talked about tonight that you can share with them to encourage them with, with this truth. You know, they might be on the fence or they may not believe it all, but we got the truth, folks. Share it with them. Give it to them. 